Thanks. Um, thanks firstly to Matthew for um, organising this. Um, I think it's a really good question. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of discussions going on right now. If you're kind of a bit of a policy wonk like I am, um, talking about building back better in terms of the economic um, situation that we find ourselves in. Um, in the really, really um, nerdy circles, we've been talking about finance for quite a long time. Um, Ernst is on the call as well from Banktrack. Um, and, you know, we, we, th these are really important questions, but we don't often see conversations. It's it tends to be like finance in general or banks in general, maybe on the global level, maybe on the European level, maybe on the UK level. But I think to actually look at Scotland, um, which is the, the purpose of tonight, so um, is, I think, a really interesting one. Um, we are part of the UK regulatory system, but where, for me, where there is a community of practice of things which there is in Scotland, um, Scotland has, has its own big old history. Um, I haven't got the book in here, but downstairs I've got a huge huge big tome about the history of Scottish banking and you know that there is a whole history of innovation of um not always good innovation um but in, in Scottish banking and, and and leading the way and um, there's some good things as well um in in that sort of past history so I don't want to talk for long because we've got some really interesting speakers tonight but what I wanted to do because we might have a range of people who are participating in, in this call um, and what I always like to do um, is, so the, 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 the title of tonight was Scotland's finance sector, friend or foe in the climate fight. And the thing I always like to do is that classic, what do you do when you sit down in the exam and you've got your essay question there and you've got to answer it, okay? You break it up into its constituent parts. So I just wanna kind of take, um, take a bit of that. So what do we mean when we talk about the finance sector? Now, when we get into the meat of it, there are very different parts of what makes up finance. Um, so you have banks. So banks can be as simple as the place where you put your money in and take your money out and have your direct debits going back and forth and things like that. But banks also tend to manage assets. They give loans out. Who they give loans out to kind of matters and who they don't give loans out to matters. Then you have a whole, so there's a whole banking sector, which is part of finance then there's kind of finance more broadly where we have investors. So on the call tonight, we have Andrew um, Cave here from Bailey Gifford and they are an active investment firm, which is the idea that they, he will tell you more about it, but that you would put your money in there and those investors will actively seek out companies to invest in, to work with in the hope that those companies will grow and create more money and more value and that will be good for you and for your money and your investments that have, that have gone in um other types of investors we have we have also on the call and we have david here from lothian pension fund so a lot of people most a lot of people won't ever have any money to invest except through things like their pension funds all right so i've i finished a phd at age 35 four or five I can't even remember now I've reached that that sort of age um but I up until like recently I've never had any extra money okay so so but most people will have in some form some kind of pension funds especially now you have an auto enrollment and things like that and pension funds decide similarly what to do with your money where do they put it so that by the time you retire um you have some money to live off and the really interesting thing, I think, with pension funds, they um, and maybe we'll get into this later on. But for me, when I retire, I want to retire on a healthy planet where basically everything's not on fire and it's not a kind of children of men situation. Like I it doesn't matter to me exactly how much money I've got, as, but I need to be able to enjoy that on a healthy planet. Um, so I think there's a, there's kind of some extra ethical things in there with pension funds um, that aren't normally there. There are some other key players um, which we don't have on the call tonight. So we have regulators. So in the UK, we have the um, Financial Conduct Authority and um, we have the Prudential Regulation Authority and we also have our central bank. Um, and they sort of set the rules of the game. Um, so that might be something that we need to talk about later on when we're talking about who and where um, action, more action might need to be taken. 
Um, and you also have things like industry bodies and um, kind of groups that come together around things. So there are some positive groups in the UK. There's the um, things like the financial, um, uh, the task force on climate related financial disclosures, which um, we'll, we'll, maybe, we'll maybe sort of talk about. Um, and there's also things like the Green Finance Initiative, um, which is trying to look at different ways to do this. So if we break down the essay question, if that's what the finance sector is and there's different players within that, why is it important? So for me, I would say it's important for, there's kind of two main sides to the coin. So on the one hand, there is, um, we need to stop funding bad things that are destructive and are destroying the very earth and all of its ecosystems that we rely on so that's what you would a lot of people probably know most about which is about divestment okay take the money out of the bad things that's one that's one challenge but i think as we might hear later on it might not be such of a big challenge as we might think although there's, there's probably a lot further to go but on the flip side of that there's where do you put your money so that it positively creates a better climate outcome that it it can how and where and what mechanisms do we have to invest in the good things that we need we need to invest in climate mitigation we need to invest in um climate adaption we need to invest in the new technologies which will release us from our reliance on fossil fuels and so those are the things that are maybe a little bit trickier as well um, and so in terms of Scotland's finance sector, we're, we're going to hear from, as I say, a pension fund and an active investor from Scotland. And we're also going to get that, that slightly wider look from, from earns from bank track. But the other, the other big thing in Scotland, which is going to be happening this year, as Matthew said, is the Scottish National Investment Bank. So the other player that most countries or a lot of countries have is they have state or public investment banks. And what we see in so the European Investment Bank, we can we can talk about this later if there's any questions, but the European Investment Bank, they are heavily investing in that positive side of things. So they've said they're going to finance a trillion euros um, by 2030 into positive kind of climate investments, not just taking the money out of the bad stuff, but actively fitting that finance gap of what we need for the good stuff. Um, but we have the Scottish National Investment Bank, which is two billion, which is very, very small in comparison to the European Investment Bank, but it is a start. And one of the three missions that the Scottish National Investment Bank are going to be doing um, is about the climate emergency. And that is specifically to help invest to enable a just transition to net zero by 2045. So that's in line with the Scottish government's aim for net zero. Um, so that might be something else we might want to consider in the mix. And yeah, I, the, there's, there's quite a lot that we could go into in this. So, you know, what does good enough mean? So when we talk about friend or foe in that other part of that essay question, um, I, I hope that what we'll come away with tonight and my challenge, I guess, to the speakers is how can we have a more nuanced idea of, you know, of, of what this is, of, you know, finance where is it a friend and where is it a foe because it will be both at different points and the same company will be a friend and a foe at the same time most likely because these things are complicated but how can we tonight make some progress in understanding what is it that we need to do in in Scotland's finance sector in order to pioneer to lead the way to make this a much better place especially because we are the place that's going to have a public investment bank so we have some levers of power that Westminster don't have um, and it's something that maybe you know the pension funds and you know active investors like Bailey Gifford who who want to make a difference. Maybe there's something that we can think about that's a bit more of a creative solution to make sure that you know Scotland's finance sector are going to be a friend in this climate fight. Um, so that's my sort of little intro there. Um, and I just, I'm going to hand over to Ernst. Um, and Ernst, I think you're, you are going to be a, um, you've got a PowerPoint, so you should be able to share that yourself. Um, so yeah, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, uh, let me check which one do I have to share. I think it's, does this work? No, does it? It yes, does, but if you just press the, yeah, that's it. That's fine. 
Oh wait, uh, I oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, yeah, this this fine. Just one last check before I start. Or yes, fine. Okay, cool. Uh, great. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, thanks all for attending. Uh, my name is Ernst and Kuiper, or just call me Ernst if you want. Um, I am a climate campaigner at Banktrack, uh, and you can reach me at Anton at Banktrack.org. Um, I'm obviously not here to talk about myself, but um, it might be interesting for you to know that uh, before uh, I started working at Banktrack which was in the beginning of this year. Uh, I worked as a climate scientist at Utrecht University. Uh, before that, I finished my master's in climate physics. Uh, and, dur and during my PhD, I studied uh, melting of the Greenland ice sheet. And the stuff I learned during my master and PhD freaked me out to such an extent that uh, I became a climate activist as well. Uh, I'm also active. Um, in Extinction Rebellion, which you probably all know about because it's quite large in the UK, uh, which we're kind of jealous of. Um, so, well, enough about me. Uh, I'll quickly go through what we do at Banktrack. Uh, we are um, uh, a civil, so uh, civil society watchdog uh, on private sector commercial banks. Uh, we are based in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. Personally, I live in Utrecht, but the Netherlands luckily is quite small. Uh, and we uh, were founded in 2003. And well, if you want to have any information about uh, private commercial banking, uh, or at least of the biggest banks in the world, uh, you can visit us at Banktrack. We have quite some, quite a lot of information there. Uh, and our mission is to stop banks from funding uh, harmful business activities, uh, basically uh, in whichever way we can. Um, so I heard a lot of people here who are on the positive money or positive banking uh, side. We track banks for their negative impact on uh, the environment and human health. Uh, so we um, do basically four things. Uh, we track banks, which is actually quite a lot of work because uh, we need to do a lot of research on, in my case, uh, how much uh, each bank is financing fossil fuels for example, because banks do not advertise themselves in that way. Um, we put all this information on a website, which way you can find it. Um, we engage with banks, so we go to AGMs. This year it was kind of, prob kind of problematic due to Corona, but normally we, we, go, to a uh, we go to AGMs, we discuss uh, stuff with the sustainability department, et cetera. Uh, we campaign, so we go to banks, we start campaigns, we start petitions, we protest in front of the bank, etc. Uh, and we support uh, other NGOs or local groups um, or indigenous people. Uh, in this example, we um, we help them to stop funding DAPL, the, the card access pipeline in the US. Um, so what is the climate crisis? Well, I'm not going to spend too much time time on this because you probably already know, uh, mostly caused by burning of fossil fuels. About 85% of our emissions are coming from fossil fuels and the remaining 15% from deforestation. Um, and um, well, I've used, um, so the IPC report, which you probably all know, um, mentioned this one sentence, which I repeat over and over again. Um, uh, it said that in order to have a 50-50 um, a chance of staying below 1.5 degrees, we need a rapid and far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. Um, and I leave it up to you whether we live in a society that is experiencing these rapid and unprecedented changes. Um, so as I said, uh, in order to have a 50-50 chance of staying below the, what we hope will be uh, a livable 1.5 degrees of global warming. Uh, we need to um, have our carbon dioxide emissions by 2030 compared to 2010 levels uh, and reduce them to effectively zero by 2050. So that's uh, quite a solid benchmark um, and, and one of our demands that we have uh, at Banktrack um, for the banks that, that we follow. Um, so banks, they do a whole, lo uh, a whole variety of financial services. So they have project finance, uh, corporate loans, of course, they underwrite bonds and shares, um, and the bank, and each bank also has an asset management uh, branch, which we at BankTrack do not track um, sim simply because, well, uh, 
because of the lack of capacity. Um, so we uh, check project finance, corporate loans, and underwriting of bonds and shares. Um, and we do that together with a, um, a bunch of other NGOs, uh, and we release our big report, which is called Banking on Climate Change, uh, each year. Um, next year, it's going to be called Banking on Climate Chaos, by the way, in case you uh, will be looking for it next March. Uh, but this is what we got. So we follow the 35 biggest banks in the world, which uh, those are the, the JP Morgan Chases, the Barclays, the HSBCs, uh, and Royal Bank of Scotland as well. Uh, and we track how much they finance fossil fuels. And what we see is that it still increases year on year since the Paris Accord was signed. So it increases by, by roughly 30 billion a year which means that if we continue on this course, we will reach 1 trillion um, in about a decade. Uh, so, um, well, you might wonder, uh, okay, you know, we continue to, to fund fossil fuels, but we probably also need fossil fuels. Uh, that's definitely true. Uh, but then I'm, uh, but that's why I included this slide, which I think is, is quite good. It's from, um, it's from, uh, what's it called, uh, Oil Change International. Uh, and it basically shows um, how much uh, the carbon budget is uh, for reaching either 1.5 or two degrees. Uh, and I don't wanna go into too many details, but the carbon budget means how much carbon we can still emit as a human civilization, so to speak, before we reach either 1.5 or two, or, two, or two degrees. Um, so um, in the one over here, you can see that we have about 500 gigatons of carbon dioxide left uh, to have a 50-50 chance of reaching 1.5 degrees uh, and about 1,100 um, gigatons before we have a 66% chance of staying below 2 degrees. Um, the uncertainties in these budgets are quite high, but if you take a look at, um, well, graph on the left side is what uh, the current developed global fossil fuel reserves already have like in them in terms of carbon dioxide. So uh, those are the current oil wells, the current refineries, the pipelines and, and all that stuff. So you can clearly see that the current developed reserves are already more than enough to pass us um, to, to blow us past 1.5 degrees. Uh, and it's almost certainly enough to pass us below two degrees, uh, above two degrees, I mean. Um, which basically leads to one conclusion on a somewhat global scale that um, all expansion of fossil fuels is incompatible with the, uh, with the goals, with the temperature goals of the Paris Climate Board, whether that's 1.5 or two degrees. Uh, which is one of my main talk talking points, I repeat, over and over again. Um, because, um, because in the meantime, um, global banks continue to fund fossil fuels. And here you can see a, a list of the 35 banks that we track. Uh, and uh, I hope it's clear. The slide is quite small, but I hope you can see it. Uh, JP Morgan Chase is by far the worst bank in the world when it comes down to funding or financing, I should say, fossil fuels. Uh, but British Barclays uh, or U UK Barclays and HSBC are, uh, I think number, what is it? Se seven and 12 or something like that. Um, and since the, in the last four, four years, they've flushed about 85 to 104 billion US dollars uh, into fossil fuels. And on average, about a third of this money goes into developing new reserves. So new oil wells, uh, exploration for new fields, uh, new refineries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which I said is simply incompatible with the uh, temperature goals in the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, so I have uh, one or two minutes left, I see. If not, please stop me. But uh, <laughs> so about the UK, uh, we, the, main banks that we track uh, are Barclays and HSBC. 
uh, which uh, coincidentally are the number one and number two fossil fuel banks in Europe. Um, so Barclays finance almost uh, 120 billion US dollars um, in fossil fuels of which 35 billion went to fossil fuel expansion. Uh, and eight, HSBC is, uh, well, uh, 86 uh, billion US dollars um, and the expansion was about 33 and a half. Um, the, these are banks that claim to be Paris aligned uh, and claim to uh, take the two degree uh, target seriously. Uh, and then for Scotland, um, we also track NetWest or formerly known as uh, Bank of Scotland. Um, they are of the 35 global banks that we track, they are the second best, uh, if I can put it that way, because they only invested about, uh, they only financed, I mean, about 12 billion um, in fossil fuels over the last years. Uh, and it's actually the first bank that publicly stated to be Paris aligned. Um, I think it was in the beginning of this year in January or February. Uh, which we're very happy about. Uh, it's just that the bank lacks at this moment um, solid benchmarks and solid targets. So the bank is trying to figure out what it actually means to be pairs aligned, how much their finance should be reduced uh, in which year. Uh, and then there's also Lloyd's, of course, uh, in Scotland, uh, which is not one of the 35 banks that we track. So I do not have um, firm solid data on that one. Um, but it is involved uh, in some very sketchy uh, deals, which includes uh, uh, the Adani coal mine, um, uh, let's see, uh, the Trans Mountain Tarshan pipeline and all that kind of stuff. Um, but they mostly focus, at least as far as I could find in the little time that I had on insurance and reassurance. <laughs> uh so that's about 10 minutes uh i hope at least yeah it is uh so i'm gonna stop sharing my screen and go on to the next presenter does it work this way it, yeah it does yeah if you just um press the stop yeah there you go brilliant yeah thank oh you. i didn't do it but someone else did that's fine <laughs> great um thank you very much um ernst and we'll just go straight in um to andrew um, so I'll just get you to unmute and change to yourself. So Andrew from Bailey Gifford, if you'd like to introduce yourself and you have 10 minutes. Great, thanks Gemma, good, good evening everybody online. So th thanks very much for having me along tonight. It's very helpful to you know, take part in a sort of an open constructive debate on these issues. And uh, although I, I represent Bailey Gifford, uh, I, I, you know, I did previously work for RBS, so Happy to take a few questions about banking as well afterwards, if that's if that's a value, although obviously can't give an, an official position on where RBS is today. So my, my background, I've been working in this field about 20 years. I uh, took a, a master's in economic development policy in London SOAS about 20 years ago. And as I was sort of coming out of that master's, the, the fledgling field of corporate sustainability was just opening up. And I was sort of interested in working in that, uh, working on sustainability issues from from the, the corporate side and it's you know it's been sort of non-stop ever since so uh my, my first role in that in that field was at rbs where um i joined rbs when it was growing very rapidly in the early 2000s and uh went on to become the world's biggest bank by balance sheet uh which actually wasn't a great place to be in 2008 when the financial crisis hit and uh, rbs needed a, a massive state aid bailout but one of the things rbs uh, had uh, done along the way was it had built up a very large project finance business and uh, one of its sub businesses uh, made some you know um, play out of the fact that it was the largest lender to oil and gas and you know booked the website and everything it was also at the time when it was um, when it blew up effectively it was also the largest uh, financer of renewables uh, of its kind as well but um, you know that sort of got lost in the noise but anyway tonight uh, I'm, I'm just going to say a little bit about the investment management sector, which people don't really um, understand very well. They often confuse it with investment um, banks who do a different role. Investment banks um, help companies with all sorts of activities in the markets like, uh, you know, raising new equity and, you know, listing on stock markets, that kind of thing. 
uh, as well as a whole range of other services. We don't do that. Bailey Gifford are a 112 year old investment manager. We're actually a very van vanilla business. We, we just do one thing and we try and do it well, which is long-term equity investing. So uh, th what that means is we, we take uh, positions in companies and we try and hold them for a long time and uh, engage with the management teams that run those businesses to work with them in a collaborative way to, to grow their business in a way which is ultimately good for profits, but also good for stakeholders and, and you know, hopefully ultimately society over the long run. And uh, the kind of people that give us money are a whole range of diverse clients. They're quite international now, but our core client continues to be public pension plans. So we actually manage ordinary people's money. So, you know, Gemma mentioned this, that uh, most people invest in equities through their, their pensions. And uh, that's very much the case with us. So, uh, you know, I take a lot of pride in the fact that we, we, we come in on a Monday, so to speak, well, at least when we had an office, and we, we try and uh, do a good job for, you know, hardworking, ordinary people saving through pension plans. Now, those clients are getting increasingly interested in our, our approach to what gets called environmental, social and governance issues, uh, ESG, as a, as, a, as a terrible acronym is. And what that means is the, the, the whole range of um, societal and sustainability issues which are relevant to investments and, and when people think about big corporations and, and, you know, and their activities. So I run the team at Bailey Gifford that oversees our work in this area. We're uh, a, a sort of growing team. It was six people when I joined in 2015. We've now got about 24 people working uh, in the business on environmental and social and governance screening and analysis. So the kind of things we look at are the, uh, you know, the environmental track record of, of companies, their plans around things like Paris alignment. Uh, we look at their wider environmental impact and supply chain. We look at social issues like diversity and inclusion and labor rights, human rights in the supply chain. Uh, we look at uh, governance issues like um, you know, ownership and alignment and uh, the you know, independent directors on the board and the level of oversight for that business because uh, you know, good governance is ultimately the, the, the way that corporations are able to deliver on stakeholder commitments. So you know, the two go very much hand in hand. Bailey Gifford uh, is Edinburgh based, but isn't very well known I, 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 with the book festival. It's been probably our best sponsorship in terms of getting our name out there because of the nice colorful bags that you see around Edinburgh and beyond. Uh, but the, the, the business has, as I say, been around for about 112 years. We're currently managing uh, about 260 billion of assets. Uh, that's, that's sterling. But the key thing is this is, this is not our money. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, we manage money on behalf of a whole range of different uh, asset owners, as we call them. So we have Lothian on tonight, and you know they, they can sort of give the perspective from an asset owner. Our, our job is 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 as manager is just to put that money to work in the markets and to try and do, as I say, a good job in terms of investment performance, but also in terms of investing in portfolios that our clients can be you know proud of and you know frankly don't cause them any reputational risks or or you know on, on welcome surprises from uh, holdings they would rather not own. Our investment book has been changing very significantly in recent years, and we're, we're probably best known as a, as a technology investor. So we are uh, a very large holder of Amazon. We're a large holder of Tesla. Until recently, we were the second largest investor in Tesla behind Elon Musk. And, and Tesla is a you know, good example of our um, you know, the kind of holding that we think we can um, you know, do a good job for our clients with, but also you know, back an important company, which is trying to make a a very significant difference uh, in, a, in, a, in, a key, in a sector. So, you know, Tesla's mission from the outset has been to not just build great cars, but to try and decarbonize the transport sector through the rollout of electric vehicles. Uh, it also solves another pressing societal concern of localized air pollution by moving to zero tailpipe emissions vehicles. Uh, but it's also involved in the renewable energy generation chain and, and critically batteries and storage, which is one of the key transition technologies that we're going to hear a lot more about and we all need lots more of, which takes me on to kind of oil and gas and coal. We, we can't transition away from oil, gas and coal until we have enabling technologies that allow us to uh, bring about a just transition. So, you know, given that people still want heat or cooling or, or mobility, it's about investing in technologies which allow us to transition away from, from carbon as quickly as we can. And, you know, just for the avoidance of any doubt, I, I absolutely buy into the, the urgency of what uh, you know, others have said with respect to Paris alignment 
and to bring about a very rapid transition in the economy. Um, earlier today, I wrote a, a guest blog for our Charlotte Street Partners, which I'm happy to send around the link to, which sets out uh, what we need to do as, as you know, quickly as possible. And one of the things I think to, 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 to sort of get across is this isn't just about incremental changes to the economy, uh, making sort of five to 10% adjustments to, to our existing uh, way of life and, and sort of international trade patterns. It's about a much more fundamental shift. So Paris alignment means uh, thinking about whole new ways to live and work and to, and to you know, uh, grow our economies and to, to invest. So some examples, we, we, we have absolutely have to stop shipping as much stuff around the world as we do. Uh, we have to uh, urgently think about uh, capping aviation and, um, and to relocalizing production in, in, in all sorts of ways. Uh, so there, there's some intriguing examples. Uh, you know, I mentioned Tesla, but they, they are unusual in that they, they have a, a sort of global design standard for their cars, but they are increasingly building them regionally. So they have a, a Shanghai plant operational. They obviously have US plants, but they also have a Berlin factory coming online soon, which will build uh, identical Tesla models, but on a regional basis. And that's a bit of a, a, a sort of a signal of where we need to get to in a much broader sense. So for Scotland, we need to think about what can we bring back to Scotland and, and manufacture much more locally in a, in a, in a you know, lower footprint way. And to give an example of one of the sectors which is ripe for change and disruption and become much more resource efficient is, is the fashion sector. At the moment, clothes are designed on a speculative basis and they're, they're produced in factories around the world on a speculative basis. They're then shipped uh, to stores, which are uh, you know, heated or cooled at its sort of ambient temperatures to allow people to come and browse the stock. Some do buy, some others don't. And um, it's a, you know, it's shopping in a physical sense is actually an incredibly inefficient experience. More importantly, a lot of the stock then goes to waste uh, and can be either landfilled or even burnt. Now, if you can imagine a different reality where uh, through a virtual reality headset, you get to browse the latest fashions. And then um, if you like uh, an item, you can then order for that item to be made in your exact sizing at a local production facility, so made to demand. So, you know, no waste in, in, in the system. Now, that's actually not as a far-fetched leap as it might seem. There are lots of companies working on um, areas like this. There's also lots of really exciting investments working on uh, the, you know, the uh, shared ownership economy of, of everything from cars uh, through to you know electric bikes and scooters, through to even things like tires, our, our carpet tiles, uh, our, our clothes, as I mentioned. So we, we have some interesting holdings in that space. So uh, I, I guess I really want to get, get across in, in this sort of short pitch is we've already transitioned away from oil and gas uh, as, as, a, as a business. We still have some um, you know small investments, but um, uh, the percentage of oil and gas in, in our, on our assets under management is well under 1% now. And really what we're uh, most excited about is the transition technologies I mentioned. And we have a really interesting portfolio of holdings in areas like batteries, uh, in areas like uh, personalized healthcare, which again is much more efficient. So the kind of technologies people like Illumina are, are working on of genetic sequencing to allow much more personalized um, medical interventions built, built on patient data, that all has the potential to become a, a quantum leap more efficient than the existing healthcare services we have today. So I think there's, there's, there's lots to be excited about. There's, there's a huge amount of challenge, but uh, you know, we're beginning to see a very strong client interest in transitioning in this way. And for that reason, we're beginning to roll out our own uh, products, which are uh, looking at you know, Paris alignment and, and you know, building that in to their methodologies. And or we're seeing you know, very, you know, very healthy client interest in some of those products. So, the, you know, the, the big change is beginning to happen. And I think that really the, the challenge for all of us is to think about how can we accelerate that now very rapidly and uh, really make best advantage of the next two decades. So I think I'll stop there. Right. Thank you so much, Andrew. And yes, I think people would love to have sight of that blog. So if you wouldn't mind when you get a chance to pop that in the chat, um, that would be great. Um, and finally, I'm going to, last but not least, I'm going to hand over to David. Um, let me just get you up there. Um, David is from Lothian Pension Fund, um, and you can tell us a bit about um, who you are and what you do. Great, thanks. 
Thanks, Gemma, and thanks to uh, Ernst Jan and Andrew uh, for those talks. Really uh, interesting stuff. Uh, so, my name is David Hickey. I am a um, European Equity Manager at Lothian Pension Fund. Um, I'm also the lead for Lothian on all matters RI, so that's responsible uh, investment. Um, now, Lothian Pension Fund is the local government pension scheme for um, Edinburgh and the surrounding areas. We have many different uh, employers um, that we provide uh, our pensions for. Um, we manage assets of around eight billion pounds on behalf of over 90,000 members. And echoing what Andrew was saying, we're talking about normal people here. We're talking teaching assistants, we're talking refuse collectors, we're talking lollipop men and ladies. That is our, um, that is our uh, member base. Um, we're not talking uh, hugely rich people. You know, these are, are people that will, you know, spend um, long working lives uh, working up these defined benefit pensions um, to, to see them through retirement. Now, um, Gemma mentioned uh, earlier in her um, introduction that she herself has a pension. She would be willing to uh, to, to take a cut, take a hit, uh, as it were, um, to um, to invest in different things, green things, or or stuff that, that she more uh, closely uh, aligned her values with. Well, when you're a member of a, a defined benefit scheme like um, Lothian Pension Fund, you are not building up a pension pot. What you're doing is every year you get a little bit more of your um, salary as pension. So for, for someone like me who is a current member, I get 149th each year of my average salary throughout my career with uh, with Lothian Pension Fund. So that means that there is um, that there is effectively no risk for the members. You know, they're promised an amount of money. And our number one priority, our number one fiduciary duty is to pay that pension in full and on time. Now, because the members don't have a risk, um, they don't really have a massive say in what we do and what we don't invest in um, because, you know, essentially they're not taking the risk. We have to manage the risk on their behalf. And that means investing in things that we think will provide a good return. Now, having said that, we are very, very much committed to good stewardship. Now, good stewardship for us means that we manage the risks of environmental, social and governance issues that Andrew has already touched on, um, that we engage with our companies to make sure that they're doing the right things, that we vote when we don't think they're doing the right things. Um, to detail that, we launched um, a document called the Statement for Responsible Investment Principles this summer. And that details asset class by asset class, what we think um, is a, a reasonable uh, approach to the various asset classes. And we've already talked about equities, but there are also bonds, there's properties, there's what are called real assets. So these are things like infrastructure projects, private things, wind farms, um, electricity networks, things like all these different things that we own as a pension fund. Um, so I'm going to um, take a, a, a little uh, segue into different uh, subject. We, we've mentioned the word funding quite a lot here. Um, people talk about funding things through the pension fund. Now, for me, funding means one thing. It means the allocation of capital into a business. That is funding. Now, when you're investing in things like equities, um, you are buying something that already exists effectively. So when you buy equities, you buy them in what we call the secondary market, you buy them on the stock market and then you hold them and you'll get given two things essentially there. You're given the rights of ownership, which uh, allow you to have a dividend from that company and you're allowed to vote at the AGM. What it doesn't do is it doesn't change the funding position of the company. So if I invest in Tesla or if I invest in Shell, it doesn't change the, the amount of money that they have to invest in their products and services and their plants, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why we are not fans of uh, the divestment argument, because for us, divesting is not 
taking money out of those companies. It's simply selling your ownership onto another owner. And that owner may not be a responsible investor and may not actually be interested in climate change at all and, and all these things that we look at in our uh, ESG policies. Um, so there, there's no guarantee that they're going to continue trying to push the companies into good, um, into good habits. Um, now, like, like all of uh, you out there, is we exist as individuals in the real world. We don't exist within our portfolios. Our portfolios are a snapshot of the market. If we were to sell all our oil and gas companies, that wouldn't stop oil and gas companies existing. That would merely put the, um, the engagement efforts onto someone else. So we, uh, we take this uh, approach, we call it uh, engage your equities and deny your debt. And that means that we, we uh, speak to our equity holders, um, our, our companies that we invest in equity in, and we try and um, get them to commit to things like Paris alignment to um, better outcomes on climate, better social outcomes. But then going back to this question of funding, as Ernst Jan was talking about, bank lending, et cetera, et cetera, where well, you can lend to companies by uh, through the bond market. And companies will come very regularly to the bond markets and they will issue new bond paper. Um, and this is, this is what we call corporate debt. Um, and that recycles about once every eight years on average. Um, and basically, we've got a policy where if we don't like what you're doing as a business, we won't buy your debt. It's as simple as that. And we, um, we're we encouraging other asset owners very much to follow our lead because if a company isn't Paris aligned, and we can talk later about what Paris aligned actually means, but if it's not Paris aligned, then none of us want to see those, um, those business practices occurring. So we will not be providing new funding to allow companies to build new oil and gas exploration, et cetera, et cetera. So that's part one on, on the uh, statement of responsible investment principles. I recommend you go off and read it um, and we'll put the link up later. Um, what else do we do? We do a lot of collaborative work and a lot of engagement work with companies. We collaborate with other asset owners um, to try and uh, you know, move the needle. We're involved with um, Climate Action 100 Plus. Uh, we were involved with the uh, Share Action um, uh, proxy voting at Barclays to try and get them to improve their, um, their climate uh, funding model. Uh, and we will see how well that goes. Um, and we were also involved with um, a company called BlackRock. Uh, BlackRock are the world's largest uh, investment house. So uh, Andrew said Bailey Gifford run in excess of 200 million uh, pounds. BlackRock run almost eight billion, uh, eight, sorry, eight trillion uh, dollars uh, in assets under management. And through um, direct engagement uh, carried out by myself uh, alongside others with the uh, executive board of BlackRock, we were able to get them to, to join Climate Action 100, which is a, a collective investment, uh, collective engagement initiative targeting the 167 largest emitters in the world to uh, improve their record, to try and pivot towards uh, Paris alignment um, and bringing in this kind of extra uh, muscle to the argument, taking that up to 45 trillion in uh, assets uh, under management as part of that engagement process it really does allow us to have a voice as investors to change the practices of those companies. So um, yeah, to, um, to recap, um, we think that engagement is very much the route forward uh, to, change the, uh, to, to change the behavior of company management. And that's a collaborative effort with the top management of companies. If companies don't um, do, uh, don't invest in a way that you would like them to and are putting in new plant, new um, capital expenditure in areas you don't agree with, that's a huge business risk. 
deny them that debt and use your banking as well, like uh, as Jan said, and try and deny them the debt from the, the, the banking side as well. Um, I genuinely believe that um, we are coming up now for, on the, the decade of asset owners. I think asset owners have, have realized between themselves that no one's going to change this in the finance world. The, 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 there is a big gap. And that big gap can be filled by collaborative asset owners because we are the closest thing to the members. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, that they're one step removed from the vast majority of people that own these uh, many, many, many trillions of pensions assets throughout the world. And it's through things like climate action and IIGCC that we're gonna make those, those uh, changes. And I will leave it there. I'm sorry, I might've gone a minute over.